If anyone would like a church Bible uh, to follow the reading in, you just have to raise your hand and one should descend on you. <laughs> I can see the welcome people are getting active. Our Bible reading this morning is from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. In the Church Bible, it's on page 11, uh, 1177. So, page 117 in the Church Bible, Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly fathers with earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour and their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Let's pray. Let me pray. Father, as we come to your word, we want to listen. Give us hearts that are responsive. Open our eyes to see. And please change us to be more like Jesus. For your name's sake. Amen. Please do sit down. And open your Bibles again to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, that's page 1177. 1177. There's an old Peanuts comic strip. Lucy walks into the room and Linus is watching TV, her younger brother. And he says, I got here first, so I get to watch what I want. Lucy just walks over to the TV and changes the channel. Linus shouts, hey. Lucy looks at him and says, in the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew, it says that many who are first shall be last, and those who are last shall be first. <laughs> Linus is stumped. And in the last caption, he murmurs, I'll bet Matthew didn't have an older sister. <laughs> last week, we started this section of Ephesians where Paul teaches that one of the ways that it, it's shown in our lives that we're filled with God's spirit is to submit to one another. Submission, of course, to authority is necessary for any society to function. But more than that, we want to show, by our joyful and humble submission, that it is indeed good to submit to God. Submission should be part of our witness as a church. Now, that may not sound particularly attractive or good news to many. In our relationships, we generally assume that others are not going to look out for our needs, and so we must take care of our own. Instead of submitting, we feel the need to compete, to defend our rights. If not to win, at least not to concede any ground. Whether that's at work, in marriage, with our siblings, our parents, submission is not generally a popular idea. Two young brothers were waiting for their mother to cook the pancakes, and they began arguing over who would get the first pancake. Kevin and Ryan are the two brothers, and the mum saw an opportunity here for a lesson. So she said to the boys, if Jesus were sitting here with you, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake, I can wait. Kevin looked at his younger brother, Ryan, and said, Ryan, you can be Jesus. <laughs> Submitting only works if we trust that God ultimately has our back. Last week we saw in the whole area of marriage that 
uh, submitting is a challenge and demanding. But this week, we're going to look at parenting and the workplace. Now, obviously, not everyone here has parents or even children. Not everyone here is in worked, paid employment. But all work that we do comes under this bracket. And family, I believe, is something that we should do together as a church family. But this whole section on submission started with Ephesians 5, 21, which had this verse, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Whatever sphere of life we're in, if we're a follower of Christ, submission, mutual submission, should be a way of life for us. And we submit in our relationships out of reverence for Christ. We submit to follow his example, but we also submit to show him to the world. So let's start with the first one, which is obey and honour your parents in the Lord. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Now it's true, there's so much more that should and could be said about parenting than just obedience. But there's certainly not less to be said than obedience. Parents often complain how hard it is to be a parent. Well, it's no easier to be a child, is it? In fact, I'd say it's probably harder. Because children have to submit and obey someone who should know better, but often doesn't seem to. So what does Paul say that will help? Well, first of all, he says that the obedience of the children should be in the Lord. Maybe verse 1 is so familiar, so self-evident, that we miss the importance. Paul is talking to the children. He's addressing the children as part of the church. He's speaking to them as moral agents who can choose to worship God. That's not always the way that children have been viewed throughout history. You remember when the disciples kept the children away from Jesus because they thought that they would be a nuisance to him. Paul's assuming that some children have chosen to follow Christ. And that's why he tells them to obey their parents in the Lord. In the Lord doesn't describe the parents, it describes the children and their obedience to their parents. But what does it mean? Well, when we were looking at Ephesians 5, it said that all followers of Christ are light in the Lord. That's the fundamental identity of a follower of Christ, to be in Christ, to be in the Lord. But it's not just their fundamental identity. It's actually how they are able to live this challenging, countercultural new life of submission. Being in Christ is why we submit, and being in Christ is how we submit. Filled with the Spirit of Christ, we can do the impossible. Children can do the impossible of submitting to flawed parents as part of their worship to their perfect father. So the second thing that Paul says is it's right. When Dave spoke last week about submission in marriage, it, it felt like a big ask of wives and husbands. But Paul wanted them and us to see that marriage is, is pointing to something so much bigger. It's more than just a promise made between a man and a woman on earth. It's pointing to the big marriage, the eternal marriage, the covenant agreement between God and his church. So this marriage will pass away but the marriage between God and his people is eternal. So our submission in marriage is possible and it's necessary because we've got a bigger and more beautiful story to tell. So as we consider how challenging it is for children to submit to their parents in imperfect families with imperfect parents, we have to see that this is about so much more than just a family trying to be the perfect family or even just trying to survive as a family. So in Ephesians 3, we saw this. We said that the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. God is the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. In contrast to every flawed parent here on earth, the Heavenly Father is raising for himself his own family. And that family is eternal. So everything we do in our families, it's meant to be a visual aid. It's meant to be just a glimpse. It's meant to show this world the possibility of how good it is to be part of God's family. Some of you might think of your families and want to laugh. 
but it is possible by grace. And that's our hope, isn't it? Our children are surrounded by friends who may disregard their parents, they may disrespect their parents. If they do submit to their parents, it, it's out of duty, it's out of fear. What a powerful witness if the children of this church decide that they will joyfully and humbly submit to their parents and say how good it is. Isn't that something that we could pray for, that we could long for? So it's right, Paul says, that children should admit, submit to their parents in the Lord because God wants all children to submit to him as the perfect father. But God has chosen earthly parents to represent him as our heavenly parent, but it's not just right, because it's also good. This commandment comes with a promise that it may go well. As we've gone through this series in Ephesians, it might sometimes feel a bit repetitive that we keep saying this, but actually we shouldn't tire of hearing about grace. God's grace should be music to our sin-weary souls. So it's important to stress that the obedience of the children is not so as to become God's children, but because they are God's children. They're described as in the Lord. Their obedience to their parents expresses their identity. It doesn't achieve for them their identity. The commandment is not so they secure a place in the family. It's not so that they maintain a place in the family. It is so they can enjoy their place in God's family. There are blessings to be enjoyed by submission to God and his family. This is the way for society, this is the way for people to flourish. Obedience and submission, they're not easy, they're not simple. They're certainly not popular. But I don't think any of us would suggest that society will flourish if children disrespect and disobey their parents. But we need to notice two things here. The first is that this commandment that Paul quotes, it, it's one of the Ten Commandments. That commandment, that set of commandments, was given to not just a group of individuals, but to a community. There will be a times when, when obedience for a child may feel like a bind and not a blessing. It may feel that they're being condemned to failure and not to flourishing. And maybe for many that feels like it for a lot of the time. But the promise here of flourishing is made to the whole community. Communities will work better when there is respect and obedience within the family, even when that is, because of our sinfulness, distorted and corrupted on an individual level. But you still ask, well, where does that leave the child who is obeying but not flourishing? Or even the spouse who is submitting in marriage but not experiencing any blessing? Well, that's where we need to notice something else, that Paul quotes the fifth commandment, but he changes it. So the original commandment said that there was promised long life in the land, in the promised land. But now in Ephesians, Paul is saying that the children are not in the land, they are in the Lord. And the promise is for on the earth. So the blessings that we're longing for are not in the promised land, fruitful harvest but instead the fruit of the Spirit in our lives in Christ. We're not waiting for a return to Jerusalem. We're waiting for the return of Christ when he will rebuild, remake this creation, and we will enjoy the perfect family forever with him. During World War II, the German theologian Helmut Tillich went to visit his friend in Stuttgart, and the city had just been bombed, and his friend's house was a pile of rubble. Instinctively, Tillich started to, to tidy up, to make best of this mess that he found of his friend's house. But then suddenly his friend appeared, wearing a suit with a flower in his uh, buttonhole, and he invited Tillich to have tea at a, at a table in the one undamaged corner of the kitchen. There was one area that hadn't been damaged. And there was this beautifully laid table with tea laid on it, perfectly. Maybe that seems a bit eccentric, a bit quaint, but I think it's a beautiful illustration. Because not everyone will think that Christian submission is sane, but we do want them to see it as beautiful. And in this 
broken world, in amongst the rubble of this sinful world. We want to create a little corner of beauty that speaks of the new creation that we're longing for, that speaks of the family we're longing for. But inspiring as this is, we must have objections. What about abusive parents? Well, no child is being expected or commanded to submit to a situation of abuse. If you have any concerns about this, if you've witnessed any suspicion of abuse within this church family, please speak to our safeguarding officers, John Poole and Martha Fairchild. The Bible assumes that parents are sinful and flawed, but the Bible doesn't assume that parents are abusive. Abusive parents are the exception to the rule. The general rule still holds that submitting to your parents is right and good in most situations. What about state intervention? These verses say, they assume, that the right place for children to be nurtured is within their families. So even when the state deems it necessary for the safety of a child to remove that child from their family, they still seek to place the child in a family because the family is where God has ordained that children and society will flourish. The family and not governments, the family and not schools should be the primary role in bringing up children. So that means for a flourishing society, governments will always want to support rather than undermine families. Now the primary role of the family has felt a little bit under threat in recent times with the whole culture war over gender ideology and sexuality, where some parents have been sidelined, decisions taken with their children, but the parents not involved. I think the recent CAS review feels like a step back in the right direction, but I would encourage you to sign up for the regular emails from the Christian charity Care for the Family. They will often highlight where there is any legislation being discussed or passed in Parliament that is undermining that primary role of the family to be parenting children. And it gives you the opportunity to write letters to your MP and, and express concern wherever the right of the family to, to bring up the children is being taken away. Now, this is going to be a hard path because there are extremes. You do have extreme ideologies and, and, and religions that harm children. And on the other hand, you have situations where children are taking decisions apart from their parents that they really need to be taking with their parents. And somehow we're going to need to, to walk a path between those two. We're going to need wisdom and grace, but we must not lose confidence to assert what the Bible asserts, that the family is still the best place for the bringing up of children, for them to flourish and for society to flourish. What about parents of different faith? What about if a child believes, but their parents don't? The state may not always agree with the values of the church and the family, but they must protect the family as the primary place where children will be nurtured and give freedom to parents to bring their children up with those values. But likewise, there are children who follow Christ who have parents who don't have the same faith, and there's no exception clause. The in the Lord is not describing the parents. In the Lord describes the children. And so children who have parents who don't have the same faith, they should still submit to their parents. And I think obviously the only exception to that would be if the parents insist they either deny Christ or do something that is actively sinful. But what would you say then to a child whose parents tell their children not to attend church? Well, I think that the children should still obey their parents, but they should seek a conversation about it. What is the parent's concern? Is it that they feel that the child is, is being distracted by church and not giving proper time to, to school? Is it that they feel that the church is dangerous, it's cult-like, it's sucking their child in? Some children in these kind of situations have, have, have looked for, for creative ways to, to find another way. They've offered to, to give up football so they can still do church and keep up with their schoolwork. They've, they've offered to wake early on a Sunday to help in the house so that they won't always be accused of not pulling their weight because they're always out before lunch on a Sunday. 
But I still think that if the parents, after every effort is made, insist that the child does not attend church, then a child should obey, but ask that that conversation be revisited at another time. What about, though, adult children? In the Bible, the only clear line drawn when a child is no longer under the authority of their parents is when they get married, when they leave their parents, become one with their spouse. But I think in the different cultural context we're living in now, I think our modern-day equivalent was, would be when a child becomes meaningfully independent, either having moved out of the house or has become financially independent, that then the command to obey has gone. But, of course, the command to honour remains. The command to honour remains all the way through our lives. It will change in different contexts, but still the command to honour is there. It's time to move on from children to parents. The next thing that Paul says is to nurture children for the Lord. Verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Fathers could equally be translated parents here, but often fathers is used because fathers were given the role of leadership in the family. But what's important to notice here is that although children are expected to obey, obedience is not the end goal of parenting for the parents. That may be a challenge to some of our parenting priorities. Who doesn't want well-behaved children? Who doesn't look at families who have well-behaved, respectful children and think, I'd love a bit more of that kind of obedience and respect in my home? But our ultimate goal is not obedient children. Our ultimate goal is children coming to Christ. Verse 4, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That word translated bring them up is literally from to, to nourish or to feed, which is why I chose the word nurture. Now in Roman times, a father had absolute authority to do what he wanted with his children. But in the Christian household, Paul is saying, that the father is not to be God in the family. He is to represent God to the family. The father is under the final authority of God, and so the, the children are his stewardship. He is stewarding those children for their ultimate father, God. The goal is not obedient children. It's mature adult Christians. If we're honest with ourselves as parents, I think we want children that we can be proud of, and not children that God is proud of. We want children to make us look good rather than children that make God look good. Now, we can't make a child follow Christ, but we can prepare a child to accept Christ. And to do that, I think we need to teach our children two things about God. We need to teach them his holiness and also his love. That will require us, obviously, in our parenting to to discipline but always to show grace. The children must know that our love is not conditional on obedience, just as the father's love is not conditional on obedience. Children need to know the reality of God's judgment, but they must know that their only refuge is not to be better, but to run to grace, to the goodness of God. So when it says to fathers, don't exasperate your children... I don't think it's talking about those times when dads dance in front of their kids at a wedding. I don't think it's talking about those times when dad tell awful jokes. I don't even think it's talking about those times when a dad deliberately winds up their children, provokes them, and, and pulls their leg. I'm not saying any of that's okay. I'm just saying that's not the context. The context here is that parents frustrate their children when they don't nurture them, when they neglect to parent them for God. When I was teaching in Lebanon, a few of my students started having a discussion about who had the strictest parents. And they were all trying to outdo each other for who had the strictest rules in the house. One of my students at that point interrupted and she said her parents have never given her a rule in her life. They were naturally quickly very envious, but she corrected them. She said, I wish they'd given me at least one rule that I would know they cared. Nurturing our children for Christ is going to take time. We're going to need to give our children time, but not just time, time when they're best able to receive that instruction. And that means as parents, we need to make the right sacrifices. Too often we sacrifice what is best for our children to give them what is only good for our children. 
So we're willing to make sacrifices in our time with our children to make sure they have a, a better home, holidays, education. We might even make sacrifices simply for ourselves as well. But instead, we've got to be willing to sacrifice those good things so that we can give them more of the best thing. Time with them, showing what it is, that living for Christ is really the best thing for them. But there's another way we can frustrate our children. When we parent them without grace. When all the emphasis is on obedience. So, of course, we must insist on obedience. That's what's required of children. But we've got to be as minimalistic as possible with the number of commands we give our children. Usually what we do is we, we increase the number of rules. Why? To give ourselves an easy life. Whereas actually we should be choosing as few rules as possible that we insist on obedience. But those rules should be leading them to love God and love their neighbour. So that means that not all non-conforming behaviour of our children is the same as sinful rebellion. And parents, we need to keep showing our children that we remember what it was like to be a child and that we still are children before our Heavenly Father. Let's move on to the next submission that expected. Serve masters as for the Lord. The Christian comedian Milton Jones has pointed out that you would never get the Bible published today. It's just far too controversial. So, for example, look at verse 5. Slaves, obey your masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Now, it's really important as we come to this teaching on slaves to, to stress that the teaching on the family is all part of the context of God's good institution of the family as the, as the core unit of how he wants society to flourish. But that's not true for slavery. He's not holding up slavery as a fundamental institution of God's design for society. The Bible condemns slave trading. Paul teaches elsewhere that if a slave can get his freedom, he should. And of course, slavery then was different to what it is now. In Roman times, the vast majority of the population were slaves. There were civil servants who were slaves. Doctors, teachers were slaves. And it was very easy for a slave to, to buy their freedom. It was a way they could work their way out of it and they could establish their own professions. Now, obviously, to the church's shame, we have used these verses to condone slavery. And that is wrong. But this letter was written to followers of Christ. Many of them would have been slaves. And so Paul is not saying that slavery is good, but he's recognizing that's their context. And he wants to teach them how they will be faithful in their context. Now, I hope that no one here would describe their work as, as slavery. But whatever our work, paid or not, there is an element of a lack of freedom to our work. We're, we're not masters of our own time. There is a, an, an, an essence of obligation to what we're doing. And we will insist on, on proper treatment and on rights that have been hard won by Christians. But we're still going to need to submit to authority in our work. And here's the thing, that if Paul saw that slavery could be redeemed for Christ's service, then how much more our work? Verse 6, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. How would it change the way I work if Jesus were my boss? Well, he is, but not just because I work for the church. Whoever we submit to in work, wherever we're serving, we're ultimately serving Christ. It says we're slaves of Christ. Whether our boss or our parent or our prime minister is, is kind or mean, whether they're, they're corrupt or fair, whatever service we offer them, we can offer it to Christ. And so we do it for him, to his standards. And that means when Christ is the master, slaves and us, we're liberated from the slavery of people-pleasing. Because everything we're doing is submitted as an act of service to the king. You can cook as though Christ will be your guest. You can work as though Christ is your supervisor. You can even change a nappy as though for Christ because Christ was once a baby. Billy Graham's wife had a little notice stuck above her kitchen sink. It said, divine service offered here three times a day. 
You could engrave that in your work tools. You could put that above your computer screen. It's interesting, though, the one place you can't put it is above your TV screen. The emphasis in society is always on the duty of others to me, but the emphasis in the Christian gospel here is on my duty to others, even when they fall short. As Dave promised last week, a Taylor Swift quote. In her latest song, So Long London, she expresses the hurt and the bitterness at the end of a relationship with a guy, and, and she says this. She says, I'm off that you let me give you all that youth for free. And when she says for free, she's clearly not hoping for money in return, is she? She wants love, she wants faithful commitment. But that's the fear of all of us, not just in marriage, in families, in friendship, in work. We all fear that we will give and get nothing in return. You sometimes hear people say it, I gave the best years of my life to that company, and I have nothing to show for it. Well, how much more would slaves feel that, giving all that youth for free? But if we submit to and serve others, we are submitting to and serving Christ. And that means we're giving nothing for free. Look at verse 8. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. And so just finally and quickly, almost as a summary of all of this, this is all under one good Lord. If you've had the honor of meeting the king or the queen before, you would have received a briefing. You're, you're told exactly how you're meant to behave, how you're expected to speak, how you're expected to show proper respect and, and honor. Well, imagine if you got that briefing and the king was standing there and the person giving you the briefing at the end of it turns to the king and the same goes for you too. That's what we have here. Paul turns to masters and he says the same for you too. Verse 9, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no favoritism with him. No double standards in God's kingdom. No special treatment for the rich and famous. No diplomatic immunity because you happen to know someone in authority. The master and the slave, the king and his citizen, they will stand side by side before the Christ and they will all be slaves of Christ and they will have to give an account as slaves of Christ to Christ. And wonderfully, Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he has not already done for us. And so we come back to that verse that started this whole section, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let me close in prayer. Oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who submitted to you for the sake of us, who was willing to be considered nothing by those he created, who gave up his glory so that we could share in his. We pray that we would have every confidence that you reward all those who serve you. There is nothing lost in your service. Any shame we bear, any loss we incur, we know it is all worth it because you are rich and you are bountiful. You are generous and good and it is good to work for you. So help us to submit in this world in a way that shows people how attractive it is to submit to you. For the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen.